So the next speaker is Stefan Zlazet. Yeah, I, I told you that it was too complex <laughs> to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. From uh, um, Non-Electronic Materials Lab, this is a company in Dresden. And the talk is about ferroelectric tunnel injunction for beyond for Neumann computing. Please, uh, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, just um, is, is the pointer, a laser pointer or something here? Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to give you a talk to allow me some traveling and present some data uh, out of the BFAR Synaptic project. And here uh, I'm invited as a coordinator of this project. Um, I'm coming from NAMLAB, also working together with Sven and FIFETS and having some background in this um, all for electric hafnium oxide uh, devices and in this uh, specific project um, our main um, target is uh, to, to somehow tackle the challenge um, for edge computing devices that we have uh, faced with CMOS, um, conventional CMOS approaches and um, we're looking especially in the direction of using spiking neural networks which uh, allow to get a quite fast response time and event-based um, approaches um, which uh, can be operated on every low power operation. And uh, so the challenges in conventional CMOS implementations are typically memory devices are used uh, that are volatile or could be also non-volatile, but uh, feature then, um, if they are volatile, then uh, quite long latency in starting up uh, the whole system. So loading all the coefficients in such a neural network. Uh, they are area hungry if you want to implement analog synapses uh, with CMOS. Um, you need a lot of area and it's also um, not very power efficient, um, especially if it's oops, uh, still uh, based on separation between memory and uh, computing engine. And so we need, um, therefore, non-volatile devices which are scalable, which are low current, so that you can have a massive parallel operation. And uh, figured out that uh, the parallel devices, and here namely FTJ and FIFET devices, uh, are quite suitable for this. And um, if we look on the different uh, foractic devices, we see we have these uh, three options, uh, basically. Uh, this is the electric capacitor where you uh, apply uh, voltage poles to switch the polarization and uh, in the same way you also perform the readout operation uh, by um, transferring uh, the switched charge to a bit line and sensing this uh, with sense amp. Then we have the electric tunneling junction. It's also this kind of electric capacitor but there you sense the leakage current uh, through the device. And the FIFA device was already properly introduced by Sven. Uh, in this BFAR Synaptic project, we look, look on both FTJ and FIFA devices put for backend of line integration. And in my talk, I will mainly focus uh, on the FTJ devices. And um, so since uh, switching or programming operation is in all devices uh, similar, um, FTJ and FIFA differentiate from the FICAP that you can have this non destructive uh, readouts, sorry, this. And um, also the FDJ can be considered as um, the intrinsically uh, one of the most energy efficient uh, membranes. So it's a two thermal device, you can switch it very energy efficiently. And uh, also um, since it features quite uh, small readout currents, uh, you can operate many devices in parallel. Next slides, I will uh, just very briefly introduce uh, the Bifar Synaptic project uh, and then uh, we'll introduce uh, the AA FTJ that we're looking into and talk about program reading and also some reliability characteristics which uh, then, does this switch by just moving or no? <laughs> um, and um, then we'll show some FTJ circuit applications uh, where we have to actually uh, look on this very specific FTJ um, properties and then summarize everything. So the first synoptic project um, started uh, beginning of 2020 um, in, and uh, it's a 4 million budget. We have uh, 
uh, 11 partners out of six uh, countries, uh, so five RTOs, three universities, and two industrial partners. We're um, mainly uh, IBM and HZB looking on uh, back on the fly and FIFETs based on the silicon channel and uh, metal oxide channel. And um, Democritus, uh, CA, Leti, and NAMLAB, we are looking into implementation of um, FDJs. And then we have found some design partners, uh, Groningen and uh, University of Zurich, uh, looking in the uh, circuit design. And um, UNET with two partners, uh, they're performing mainly reliability characterization as well as uh, modeling of the stacks. Oh, I didn't miss someone. Exfab, we have providing CMOS waivers. They are an uh, industrial partner in this project as well. And uh, the general objective is uh, to develop uh, electronic synaptic devices, as mentioned, FDJs and FIFETs, and to develop uh, a synaptic technology platform for FIFETs and FDJs integrated in the back end of line uh, of uh, existing CMOS technologies. And uh, we target to demonstrate the feasibility uh, of this first synaptic concept uh, by realizing really neuromorphic uh, architectures, so really neuromorphic processes. And uh, this is just um, this high-level view on the uh, project, so this value chain, uh, we, we start from material and device uh, optimization, modeling, uh, characterization over backend of line, integration uh, towards uh, really implementation into real uh, processors. And so this is the whole value chain that you then that you need for this uh, kind of uh, device technology co-optimization, which um, I think in, maybe it becomes um, obvious on, uh, when looking into the device characters, which, which is quite important uh, when going to adoption of these devices. So, for electric tunneling junction, quite interesting uh, device, um, I think. Uh, the general idea is uh, that you have a electric layer sandwich between uh, two electrodes and the polarization uh, state alters your uh, current density that you can uh, feed through the device. And I think we will hear um, a talk uh, off of mine, uh, which is then about this single layer FDJ. Uh, for the back end of line device, uh, we have an issue using very thin for electrics because there you typically uh, deposit the material by ALD, you cannot use abitexture growth, uh, you have to uh, crystallize it, so you get crane boundaries, and also in this diagram we see that very important uh, phylectric parameters um, uh, become worse if you scale the uh, thickness down, so below 5 nanometer, uh, you really lose the phylectric properties, which means that, that uh, you cannot really scale the thickness, and tunneling through 5 nanometer, it's quite hard, so you would get quite low currents. And so the idea is uh, to use then this double layer FDJ where you add another dielectric layer uh, in this device and you separate the switching, the electric switching layer and the tunneling layer. Uh, we see here that the tunneling barrier is just um, this tiny thing and uh, we could then tunnel directly in the connection band of the electric. And, uh, having so, um, the opportunity to optimize uh, the electric switching and the tunneling somewhat independently. Uh, now it's nice that uh, Sven introduced uh, this double layer stack already for the FIFETs, you have seen this in a previous talk, and so this is the bad thing uh, about this because now we get also this complicated stack with all these uh, charging tripping issues and I will show some results on this. Uh, later on. So when looking in the programming characteristics, uh, typically we apply such a triangular voltage um, wave uh, form uh, as shown here in the upper left uh, graph, uh, for example, uh, to such a typical device, uh, 10 nanometer phylectric HZO and the 2 nanometer uh, aluminum oxide tunneling barrier sandwich between two 1000 electrodes. And if we uh, perform this measurement, uh, we measure the current, and uh, in the center we see then the resulting IV characteristics. Uh, and first of all, what we always see is uh, this, uh, this plateau here. This comes from the dielectric background. Um, so we have just uh, the displacement current, and then we also observe here 
uh, the switching peaks uh, of the ferroelectric switching. And here in this, um, in this device or in, in this um, graph, we also measured at two different frequencies. And um, uh, interestingly, I mean, it's not surprising, uh, but uh, of course, if, if you operate the device at different frequencies, then obviously you uh, end up with very different uh, currents here. So in this uh, particular device, you can have current peaks um, up to 15 milliamps. And this is uh, something to remember. And uh, also what we see on the right-hand side um, that uh, the switching kinetics depends also on uh, the, the frequency that you operate this device. So it's not just a, uh, device property, um, how this um, uh, hysteresis curve looks like, but it's really a um, property which depends on how you uh, operate the device. And you can uh, have uh, more steep uh, switching. This would be interesting for digital application or more gradual switching for analog uh, switching. And um, uh, we have here two devices, A and B. It's shown here. Uh, you can see we just uh, changed the annealing condition. So once we annealed with the tinite on top electrode, once without, and putting it afterwards, and uh, we see that it's also very sensitive to the whole uh, device operation on, on such uh, small changes in the device uh, manufacturing. And um, in order to increase the on-currents, uh, we can play around with the work function uh, of the electrodes. Um, and here in this experiment, uh, we used, uh, instead of a tinydroid, an uh, aluminum top electrode. And uh, we see in the center graph that um, we get the work function shift of the whole curve to the right-hand side. So this indicates we, we're using different electrodes, it gets uh, asymmetry. And the idea was that we come closer to the conduction band of the tunneling barrier, so that increasing the tunneling current through this uh, tunneling uh, layer. And on the right-hand side, we see then uh, the measured um, uh, current that comes out of the FTJ device A and B was uh, already explained, so this uh, two tinydroid top electrodes. Uh, but device C, we see um, there's not a big uh, increase in the current, it's just, uh, just a shift in the, in the current that we observed, even though we would expect a much larger tunneling current. And this is crazy here. Um, and uh, uh, this is something uh, I will uh, try to explain on the next pages. So there are additional effects coming in, uh, which are probably also charge trapping related. Uh, why we cannot see in this experiment um, really the increased uncurrent. Another thing that I want uh, to point at is uh, when looking on the measured currents, right hand side we see 50 nanoamps. The same device needs something like. 100 microamps to switch it. So we see, or up to several hundred microamps, the switching peaks here. So it's uh, for this FTJ device, it's very crucial that uh, you, you have in mind that uh, your switching current might be much larger than your reading current. That's why you have to somehow um, differentiate between your write and read operation, uh, which I will then show later on in the circuit examples. Okay. Um, it has been shown that uh, the FTJ to, to uh, internal depolarization fields feature not uh, the perfect retention. Uh, so this was, was shown here in the center plot by Benjamin uh, or in 2019 uh, for different temperatures. So the, the on state uh, is, uh, was not very stable. But he has shown on the upper right hand side plots that uh, this can be tackled uh, by applying. Um, uh, voltage from outside to, to improve the data retention of this state. And uh, this gives the indication that also by work function engineering, you can uh, tackle the retention uh, issue. And on the lower uh, right side plot, we see also data where the titanium um, electrode was uh, exchanged by the platinum electrode. The work function the shift is different than in the aluminum. Uh, case and in this way he could um, reuse depolarization field, uh, making retention better. But uh, in turn, as explained, you might get an uh, issue with the on-currents that um, um, also are affected by this. So there's uh, in this device a trade-off between data retention uh, and the on-currents that we 
that we have. And uh, we're looking then a bit closer into this stuff, um, looking at fast retention measurements. Uh, and this is quite new data and uh, at the moment give us some headaches. Uh, we have here few, four plots. Left hand side, it's uh, uh, quite thin, 1.5 nanometer aluminum oxide uh, tunneling barrier. Um, on the right hand side, 2.5 nanometer, uh, sorry, thicker. And we have uh, two, uh, um, two voltages that we apply to switch. So it's a fixed volt of 5.5 or for a thicker barrier, 7 or 6.5 volts. And we see uh, when performing such a characterization method as it's pointed or uh, shown on the uh, upper right hand side, um, there we perform first a switching and then wait for a while and then apply the very same switching operation again. And then if we see in the second measurement that we can switch some polarization, uh, we know that within this uh, time frame, we lost some of the polarizations. We have some back switching. So and, uh, in these plots, we actually characterize the back switching. Uh, and uh, this is uh, shown on the, on the y-axis and the, um, the x-axis is in the time delay. And we see that by increasing uh, the, uh, the, the voltage, or other way around in this case, so by lowering the voltage during switching, actually we get an increase in the back switched domains, uh, which gives an um, indication that we need a uh, larger voltage really to make a stable device or switch stably the state. Uh, similar things we see uh, if you go to a thicker oxide, uh, then we also significantly uh, increase the back switch domain. And also when looking in the diagrams, so at higher frequencies, giving shorter time, we also see more of the back switch domain. And there was a quite nice paper uh, recently by Park uh, at Aluminium, and um, there is an investigation of charge injection, which depends also on the device frequency or the operation frequency. And um, so when looking into this, uh, uh, figures out that um, this switch polarization in this device really has to be stabilized by charges which are injected into aluminum oxide or, the, or in the interface between the H2O and the aluminum oxide, um, which then stabilized the polarization, uh, thus um, somehow uh, reducing the internal uh, depolarization fields. And uh, also if we look um, on the band diagram up here again, we also see there might be two cases. So you might uh, have a very uh, fast pause here uh, with uh, not a lot of charge injection, which might lead uh, to flipping the hafnium oxide or the polarization of the H2O um, just by the ferroelectric switching. And afterwards, you get a really large field, which gets in uh, charge injection. Or there is also the other possibility that you that you have first some uh, charge injection over the interface, uh, which leads up to uh, charge build up, which um, reduces actually the uh, the potential uh, over the interface, but increases it over the ferroelectric until the ferroelectric switches. And this would be this charge mediated switching. And so there are, is a strong uh, interplay between the ferroelectric switching, the uh, charge injection, and um, and probably on different time scales, you will have the one first or the other first. And um, I mean, this is also the topic uh, that Johannes is uh, talking later about. So this is something that we are looking at the moment in and maybe it's a quite interesting uh, um, um, yeah, a, a topic that uh, is also to be investigated by simulation. Okay, um, another indication um, is uh, that we just want to show here, uh, so there is uh, also um, when looking into devices with uh, different um, oxide thicknesses and uh, performing really this uh, slow measurement. So the DCIV measurement, we see that more or less independent on the thickness, there seems to be kind of a current threshold which initiates then switching of the device. So this is not completely conclusive uh, since the split dependency is not perfect. Uh, but uh, so this is something we are also investigating now. And uh, 
Uh, this is again something that you have to, to care about if you really want to do, uh, use the device. So either you need a fast readout, but you, then you have this um, dielectric background, or you perform a really uh, slow readout, and you might get this uh, switching things. And so this uh, really trade-offs between this. And uh, I think uh, some of these uh, aspects might be uh, also interesting or might, might apply to the FIFAT case because also there we have kind of a double layer uh, device. We're now uh, looking into circuit applications. Um, uh, one circuit that uh, was already proposed in uh, 2019 is this uh, two transistor, one capacitor uh, cell where you have FG, uh, um, you use, okay, here's it. Um, so here you have an access transistor, you have your device, and uh, in this operation mode, you can directly switch the um, FTJ between, uh, so applying voltage between plate line and bit line. So you have this um, probing part, and then to integrate the tiny currents uh, and measure them, uh, you switch off this access transistor and read them via the read transistor. So integrating just a tiny charge on the gate of a single device because it's uh, such a small current. And uh, we've seen the, in the measurements there, uh, the drain current is plotted at uh, the TR strain current over time uh, during signal development that we really can differentiate uh, than two states that were previously written into this uh, FTJ. And now we're looking uh, in this circuit what's actually important uh, for this readout operation. This is, first of all, this floating node N1 capacitance, which is mainly given by the gate capacitance of uh, TR and the FTJ's capacitance, it's background capacitance, and then, of course, uh, the current that the FTJ delivers. And now there's uh, a thing that uh, your capacitance of the FTJ increases uh, linear with area, but also your current, because it depends on the current density. And so this means that there's a certain point where you can increase further and further FTJ area, but won't uh, improve uh, your signal that comes out of it. And this is shown on the right-hand side. So um, there is um, a maximum delta V N1, so voltage that you can generate on this node um, while scaling the FTJ large and large. And um, so this means that the self capacitance of the FTJ also somehow limits the signal and also has to be uh, looked at, not just uh, the on currents. And uh, now coming back to these two different concepts, single layer versus double layer FTJ, so far I would say it's not really clear. Single layer FTJ uh, definitely features a larger capacitance. It's just a very thin high K layer sandwiched between both electrodes, but might uh, feature larger on currents, whereas uh, you have uh, better capacitance uh, always in the double layer FTJ um, as, uh, at, at potentially a bit smaller currents. Um, interestingly, when looking on the diagram here, um, and this was also measured in, in 2019 and extracted uh, in, in this case, um, so this first realization of this 2D1C uh, uh, structure was made using the phylectric field effect transistor, so the global foundry's FIFAT, and using this as a FDJ because it also features a precision dependent leakage current, and uh, actually it turns out that this one uh, is a quite nice FTJ, so compared to others, and so again, uh, on the line somehow, there is um, some, uh, a link between FIFETs and uh, FTJs. And uh, one circuit example where we uh, use this concept um, is the non-volatile SM cell. So you see here in this structure, this is just a normal SRAM cell with a, a cross-coupled inverter and two access devices. And the idea here is that um, you might use this FTJ device uh, to make this uh, SRAM cell non-volatile. So before you switch off the circuit uh, or bring it in a, in a power down mode, uh, you can switch uh, the polarization uh, of the uh, FTJs depending uh, on the state that you stored on Q and QN nodes. And afterwards, um, if you power up the uh, SROM, you can then uh, start uh, developing uh, the signal uh, on this 
uh, on these two nodes. I think this is on the next slide. Um, so you start uh, first developing a tiny signal on Q and QN so that you get uh, first a uh, small differential signal there and then afterwards you power on uh, the VDD so that uh, you get the complete spread. Uh, and uh, by this uh, you mainly add uh, this FTJs, potentially adding this access transistors there, but uh, they are potentially even not um, mandatory. So this, uh, this uh, for transistors that I cannot point at at the moment, uh, down there. And uh, then looking into the structure, you see that it's actually also kind of this uh, 2D1Z uh, structure. And uh, massive parallel readout here means it would have um, a very large SROM uh, array where you have then a complete restore of all SROM cells just in one shot. And uh, another example, goes more in the direction of the synaptic um, operation. This are just some publications out, um, just to show here that uh, it has already demonstrated that also the FTJ can be already in such an analog way with gradual switching. And um, one could uh, make use of this in, uh, uh, in such a differential uh, 2D1C synaptic cell. So again, we have uh, such a 2D1C structure on the left and right hand side. And uh, they're using uh, two FDJs uh, in a different way, uh, again, uh, to, to store the um, um, differential weights. Um, we would have, again, such a, um, a first uh, pre-charge and um, uh, signal development um, phase, and then um, using uh, this in, in the center uh, this kind of uh, differential amplifier to generate uh, two currents uh, that can be then fed into a neuron. And this is something we simulate so far, having now first hardware available to combine CMOS and uh, FDJ device to we perform electrical measurements on this. And um, of course, um, uh, Interesting thing here is a readout of many devices in parallel. You might wonder, so we have here just two, uh, but of course, you uh, can conceive also concepts where then in later stage we add more and more of these devices uh, in, in such a cell. Um, here again, it was uh, measured before using just two FDJs. This was more a logic operation, but we see that uh, can also perform this NAND or NOR operation while reading two FDJ cells then uh, together uh, and um, using this, uh, this current levels to discriminate between the uh, one or zero at the end. Um, so this uh, would be the way to go in direction of uh, parallel operation of many FDJ devices. Uh, and to the summary, so general FIFETs and FDJs are quite interesting devices um, for realization of this, um, not just memory, but also beyond uh, pure memory applications or beyond uh, pure phenomenon architectures. Uh, especially in the double layer FDJ, there's this trade off between on currents and off currents, the TR ratio, the so tunneling electric resistance ratio data retention and all this read disturbs and stuff, uh, which needs uh, new characterization methods, but also modeling approach to really understand this. So far, it's not really clear what exactly happens there. And uh, uh, it seems that there's uh, quite strong evidence uh, also for charge trapping mediated switching under some uh, uh, conditions, uh, which might be similar uh, for things like also in the FIFA gate stack and then, yeah. Overall, uh, adoption of these devices needs a thorough, uh, not just device development, but also you have to think of how to make your circuit. So this design technology co-optimization, I want to emphasize this again. And with that, uh, I thank you uh, for your patience and um, yeah, would like to thank uh, uh, or acknowledge also our funding. Thank you, Stefan. So we have time for a couple of questions. Okay, I can start. I have <clears throat> two questions, actually. The first is about the, the, the 
quality of the sample in the sense, so what is really the crystallization quality of the afternoon layer? This is the first question, and how this affects the results. And the second one is, what about the interface with aluminum, with alumina, uh, um, and how traps can be localized at this interface, uh, uh, again, and how this mm -hmm. change the, the, the rest of the device? Yeah. Uh, so, in general, we think that the quality of the HO film within this uh, FDJs is quite similar. So, you get um, similar polarization uh, values. How do you so, so, what is the deposition? Uh, so, you start um, uh, like in the normal uh, HO based capacitor, we start with the HO, then you put on top uh, the aluminum oxide, and then you anneal or put first the electrode, then anneal it. And then uh, comparing the PR values um, between just pure capacitor and uh, uh, this device, you get uh, very comparable uh, PR values. So the amount of polarizable material seems to be quite um, similar. Even, it seems that we even might have, in some cases, a bit better precision in the FDJ device. So this is. I think uh, so. In, at least in our experiments, we don't feel that we lose the polarization by making this text. Um, the other question, um, I mean, it's it's really tough uh, since you ha just have these two terminals. Uh, it's really hard to differentiate between leakage currents that go through the device, uh, charges that get trapped in the stack, because uh, if you move some charge in, it's not that you just move it one side in and then the other side, it's nothing. Um, still, you would see uh, the displacement current then from this charge movement, so you cannot really see or, or say from the measurement it's just going in or through. And then the fair electric switching, it's the same two terminals. And uh, so uh, what I think um, main differentiation comes then when looking on yeah, typically the temperature dependency, timings, uh, modulating the stack, so playing around with the thicknesses um, with this uh, manufacturing process uh, to see uh, where it can induce changes and what, uh, what uh, is then the electrical answer of this. And then, of course, also the modeling plays, uh, plays a very important role uh, to really understand this, but to be honest, um, uh, the, the, yeah, it's. I mean, probably you have to also look in from from different perspectives from the modeling side, because uh, somehow you, you have to. I mean, sometimes th there's a relation between what you put in and what you get out, and first you need an idea what happens uh, to also specify which parameters do we have to extract from the experiment to put this uh, in simulation and yeah it's uh, this this interplay that you all know yeah. are there any questions from the audience if not i have <coughs> one last question mm -hmm. so you already have very tiny layers so it's uh, if i remember correctly two or two ten nanometers or so do you think that you already reached the 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 minimum layer you can even go no no down. i don't think so uh, um so um, when looking on the tunneling layer uh, now we're using the aluminum oxide um, you could have quite similar electrostatics using silicon oxide for example you have a uh, lower k you can make it thinner having the same voltage drop then uh, in, in this double capacitor structure say it this way uh, and so one would assume then having also larger tunneling currents, but also uh, we did this experiment uh, using MIM or IM, MFIM structures, so not on silicon, but uh, uh, trying to use a um, uh, um, silicon oxide from the ALD process. Uh, so it turned out that the, the current was much lower. Uh, our assumption is that this comes due to higher barrier or the, the higher uh, in the silicon oxides, 
Uh, bank app, uh, but uh, from simulation, this is not really conclusive, so th there might be also an influence of our manufacturing process that actually we think if we didn't really deposit uh, a, a good silicon oxide, and it's, it's somehow, uh, so if we lose the property of this tunneling barrier, uh, then we don't get the tunneling, then we have again the uh, virtually thick stack to tunnel through. And um, on the hafnium oxide, uh, we typically we just using now this 10 nanometer because we know it's well crystallized and, and so on. Uh, later on, we, I think we should simply scale this down to its minimum thickness because then you gain uh, in in voltage. I mean, the, if you keep the E field same, then you just reduce the voltages. Uh, you might also increase the currents then through the thing um, while keeping more or less the electrostatics similar, um, but uh, then, yeah, we, we face the problem of uh, thickness scalability, which in our film stability is in range of five, six nanometer. Below this, uh, the, the electric properties become worse. Okay, so yeah. let me just check if there are questions from mm -hmm. online people. Mm, it seems no questions, so thank you very much again. And <laughs> let me... Okay.